many of you, all of you probably know Fernando Velayos uh, from UCSF and now uh, for the past two years, the uh, regional director of IBD at Kaiser. Um, uh, and he is uh, just a renowned expert in inflammatory bowel disease and he's gonna give us a tour and update on that topic. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Dr. Chan and for the, the board for, for inviting me to, to give uh, this DDW, the best of DDW review. So what I'm gonna do in the next half hour is uh, review about 15, uh, 13 abstracts and about two papers uh, that have come out in the last year. And um, there's a couple of kind of related themes, but I'm just gonna kind of go, go through them. So the first one has to do with uh, DDW this year. There were a couple of abstracts looking at mesalamine use uh, in Crohn's disease. And this is something that is important. If you look at the most recent ACG guidelines, uh, what they actually, you see that nowhere in the guidelines for Crohn's disease um, does, uh, is mesalamine recommended for small bowel Crohn's. There is use of, uh, uh, for uh, sulfasalazine in Crohn's, but not for um, uh, small bowel Crohn's. So this was a, um, uh, a uh, database, uh, the, the Truven scan, that, that looked at how frequently are 5-ASA is being used for Crohn's disease. So you see it's a national database of commercially insured patients. Uh, they use linear regression models to examine prescription trends. And what you see of the 132,000 patients here that you look from 2009 to 2014, there was an overall reduction in the prescription rates from about 43% to about 30%. And so there has been some movement in this direction. And then, of course, they went through risk factors and talked about uh, younger age, male gender, multimorbidity as being risk factors. Uh, most of the patients actually were using self mesalamine itself. Very few of them were using the uh, azobonded, either sulfasalazine uh, or the other one. So um, in this study, basically, it said about one in three patients with Crohn's disease are still receiving a prescription for mesalamine. And although the trends are decreasing, efforts are still needed to educate uh, the providers. So the take home here is that we don't, in this study, we don't actually know how many of these patients had Crohn's of the colon. But I would say that, you know, I could ask kind of in your practice, you know, how many folks are using uh, mesalamine and Crohn's disease? And is there still a use? I think that's really the question that I think over the next one to two years we're going to be focusing on is that is there a use, is there a cost opportunity, or does it kind of make good sense that for certain patients um, we can use it? So, and we can go through some of the, um, some of that in the question and answer. Now, this one is important because if we kind of look at the three populations or the couple of populations, I think, of, of how we use Crohn's disease. There's the group that has pure small bowel Crohn's disease or maybe some mild ileitis, and we often will give something. You're not really ready to commit for something more serious. They either have incidental ileitis or very mild symptoms. We give them a salamine. I'd say probably the data would suggest that that's not really uh, effective. There's the whole issue of small bowel Crohn's disease, which I think is actually arguable. But here's another uh, uh, group that you can actually maybe make a difference in. And that is patients who, for whatever reason, are in a biologic, but also are on uh, mesalamine with, with Crohn's disease. So this one, this study looked at two national databases, a Truven and a Danish registry. And you can see that the US registry was about 2,900. There was about 218 in Denmark. And in order to get in, you needed one Crohn's disease code. And here what they're doing is that they've looked at um, patients had to be on a TNF for at least 90 days and have been on mesalamine for about 90 days before. And they use that as a marker of that th these are patients who are on chronic uh, disease, chronic mesalamine. And then what they did is that they actually looked at the patients who had stopped uh, the mesalamine agents within 90 days compared to those that continued. And what you can see here is if you can, and the, the, out the, the outcome was basically adverse events, meaning new steroid use, hospitalization, or surgery. And if you compare in the two cohorts, if you looked at the groups that discontinued versus continued, even though in the Danish cohort, the people who discontinued had slightly higher trends of, um, of, uh, of worsening, including one of hospitalization. Uh, the overall uh, sense is that for most of the outcomes, there really was not a clear indication that stopping it actually harmed someone. And it kind of makes intuitive sense that if you're on a biologic, that probably stopping mesalamine and Crohn's disease probably should not make a big difference. All right, and you can see there though that there was the cumulative rates of adverse events were similar between the two groups. So their conclusion was in uh, two national databases, stopping 5-ASA and Crohn's disease patients who were on a TNF uh, did not uh, increase the risk of adverse clinical events. And so um, that would be another group where I think we can actually add extra value, which is probably doing very little. 
And I think obviously it does um, help in terms of, uh, you know, there's a lot of cost that's associated with mesalamine. We're trying to really avoid low value care. All right, here's another question that comes off frequently, which is um, when using methotrexate uh, and anti-TNF agents, you know, should you use low dose or high dose? Uh, and this was a study out of Boston that looked at Crohn's disease or UC patients who were on combination methotrexate and anti-TNF. And what they did is that they compared the two groups, whether you use low dose, which is less than 15 milligrams a week, or high dose, which is more than 15. And this is actually a mixture of both um, uh, subcutaneous and oral. And you see there they had 163 Crohn's patients, 59 UC patients. Um, most of the patients were on infliximab. And what they examined was they looked at the primary outcome one year, which was hospitalization, use of steroids, surgery, or a change in biologic. Um, and what the, you see here, if you look at all of the outcomes, that basically whether you're on a low dose or a high dose, it really didn't make much of a difference. If you look at the outcomes of remission in a year, hospitalization, surgery, et cetera. And so um, what their conclusion, let's see if I put that, oh, and then you look at the safety outcomes, um, that there's really not much difference uh, in, the, in the two groups. So their conclusion was that low-dose methotrexate, uh, less than 15 micro milligrams sub-Q weekly, uh, was equally as effective as high-dose when used with anti-TNF, um, and that low-dose could be sufficient. And so I think really here the difference is, the question is really what is the outcome that you're trying to uh, achieve? And what is really not, you can't really get from this study, is were these patients all, you know, patients who had already failed the immunomodulator or not? I think for a clinical practice, um, if you're really looking for immunogenicity uh, benefit, I think typically doses less than 15 milligrams and oral is usually quite good. If you look at the studies, there aren't too many of them, but if you look at the bioavailability, it's roughly you know in the 80 to 90 percent. So it's actually not um, it's not 40 percent. So you're still actually getting pretty good doses, but at the same time, I think it's actually much more convenient. So I think if you're using immunogenicity, I personally uh, tend to use the the lower dose, usually between 10 and 12 and a half. I think if you are trying to uh, get efficacy, you can, t you can use the higher doses. All right, so this is a, um, something that came up during DDW, um, and this has to do with uh, um, a European uh, warning, and this was actually uh, a follow-up from something that came up from the FDA. Um, so it uh, had to do with tofacitinib. So um, what I'll do is I'll read the bottom part first. So um, it said here the warning was that patients on tofacitinib, um, and tofacitinib is basically a uh, agent for uh, ulcerative colitis, it's oral, a jack kinase inhibitor is its mechanism. Uh, it was FDA approved uh, within the last year for ulcerative colitis. Uh, and the dosing for, the FDA dosing for ulcerative colitis is five milligrams or 10 milligrams, uh, twice a day. And so they said that patients on tofacitinib twice, 10 twice a day exhibited higher rates of, of thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism compared to um, patients who, this was part of a study, and we'll go into it in a second, compared to patients who are on uh, TNFs. And the recommendation was that patients at high risk for uh, VTE and PE, and they give a list there, uh, not receive the 10 milligram BID dose. It was not seen with the 5 milligram dose, uh, but this phenomenon was not described in IBD patients. And so we'll get to the top part. So this came up because as this uh, medication was being FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis, um, the FDA or the European Union basically had questions regarding um, risk of vascular events in, in, in older patients. And so there's this uh, 1133 study, which was an ongoing open-label study looking at the safety of tofacitinib versus TNF inhibitors, and it was designed to assess the cardiovascular risk events, and was specifically designed as an event-driven trial, to, uh, specifically in patients that were over 50 years old with at least one cardiovascular risk factor, and they could have been on stable methotrexate. So even though, and, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of information because there's an ongoing trial, there's really just this announcement without really the ability to delve in more deeply things that we'd want to know. How long were the patients who were on the medication? Is this like my patients who have IBD? Is this really a, you know, should we not be giving 10 milligrams twice a day for IBD patients? So at this point, this is kind of the state of what we have. So I can only say how, you know, kind of, you know, might be a reasonable way to kind of interpret this. So right now, the FDA has not made any label changes as of yet uh, regarding 5 milligrams or 10 milligram dosing. So right now, the label is the same, uh, that both are, are, are available for um, UC patients. Um, this is very different from RA, where typically the 10 milligram twice a day dose is not actually used. So I think for us, you know, when we have patients who are quite ill, 
Um, particularly those who have failed TNF agents, usually starting on 10 twice a day to me seems makes sense. Um, I haven't seen anything to suggest that this risk is really kind of an immediate risk, but again, we don't have enough information. And I think the principle of, uh, you know, once they've reached kind of the eight or 16 weeks of induction, um, if they're doing well, to try to consider the five milligram twice a day dose for maintenance therapy. There are some patients who do flare, some patients who have been on multiple biologics where we may be a little bit concerned about reducing it, and there are patients that are just on 10 twice a day uh, chronically. Um, but I think this is something that, um, you know, if you haven't seen, uh, patients may be asking you, and so this is kind of what we know, and until the trial is done, we probably won't have more information um, to kind of help guide us. So at this point, um, I'm still using the 10 twice a day, uh, but clearly when patients are, are in remission, I try to reduce to five if possible. All right, so new therapies. So I put up three uh, pictures. What I'm going to do, instead of going in great detail about the, the, the individual therapies, I'll just kind of give an idea of what, what kind of therapies are coming down the line. Um, the first on the left is basically the IL-23 inhibitors. And uh, I put the IL-12 uh, you know, molecule kind of there because, you know, you're familiar already with ustekinumab, which is an IL-12-23 inhibitor. And that basically blocks the P40 unit. You can see there on the right. So that's how you can get... Uh, blockade of L, uh, IL-23 and 12. Um, so the newer classes that are just IL-23 IL inhibitors, um, they tend to block other subunits that are not shared, such as the P19. And we'll go through that trial shortly. The other one on the right is basically this new class of medications, these uh, sphingosine 1 phosphate, mo phosphate modulators. Um, this mechanism is used in multiple sclerosis, um, and so there's a variety of new medications that are coming out that are trying to target this mechanism, and the whole concept here is that you're modulating the receptor, the receptor so that uh, inflammatory molecules basically don't leave the lymph nodes. Um, they can actually follow inflammation in that sense. And then the bottom, uh, since we just talked about tofacitinib, is also a very popular class of small, small molecule medications, which are JAK kinase inhibitors. And, um, you know, as you kind of look at these medications, you'll become a connoisseur of which of the JAKs uh, it inhibits. You can see there some of them are there. There's a variety, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and these uh, TIC2 or tyrosine kinase inhib 2 inhibitors. Um, tofacitinib is a pan-JAK, but some of the newer ones tend to be more selective, and the thought is that that might be, quote-unquote, safer. So um, that is left to be seen. So in terms of what was presented at DDW, so... Um, these are the four uh, molecules that um, were presented. You can see there next to it is the mechanism, the disease in which it was seen, the phase, um, and then any notes. And I presented these because these seem to be ones that are promising and probably will ultimately come to market at some point. Um, the first one is uh, mirinkizumab, um, which is an IL-23 uh, inhibitor, um, given as an IV induction and sub-Q. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a classic biologic. Uh, TD1473 is actually kind of a very interesting uh, therapy. It's a JAK kinase inhibitor for ulcerative colitis. It's a very early phase, but one of its unique characteristics is that it's gut-specific. And so that in theory, it, it basically can block the, the, the JAKs, but because it's gut-specific, that it theoretically should have some um, improvements in terms of safety. And just with all of these JAK inhibitors um, and small molecules, they're not biologics, and so one of the advantages are that they're actually oral therapies for IBD. Uh, Ubatacitinib uh, is a JAK1 inhibitor in ulcerative colitis in phase 2, and it's actually already um, in phase 3 trials. And then Itrasimod, which is an S1P1 inhibitor. So these, I'm just bringing up these as names. There's kind of still early days, um, but these were the, the, the new drugs that were, the new um, uh, trials that were presented at DDW on therapies that are upcoming. And those are kind of the, the next class is kind of these S1, S1P1 modulators, uh, anti-L23s, um, and then variations of JAK inhibitors. This one I, I thought was interesting. It has to do with kind of treat to target. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, uh, and you guys may have heard of the CALM study. Uh, the CALM study was uh, presented last year at DDW, which was a prospective multicenter open label randomized controlled trial. And what it did is that it looked at um, biologic um, uh, and immunomodulator naive patients who were all had active disease. Uh, you see there the Crohn's disease endoscopic um, index score of more than six, and biochemical evidence of, of inflammation, so a CRP of more than five or a fecal calprotectin more than 25. And what they did is that they followed patients, and I'll tell you what the intervention is in a second, basically to 
uh, mucosal healing and no deep ulcerations or, or mucosal improvement and no deep ulcerations. And this was an interesting study in that if you look at the uh, top, it says conventional management, where patients, when you failed, you would respond to it uh, basically based on CDAI, so as symptoms, or if they required something that required prednisone, you would actually intervene. Uh, the, t uh, the treat to target, the t uh, t t t t t um, you had the same thing, but on top of that, you added fecal calprotectin and CRP. So meaning you could be better and not have a change triggered by a CRP, I mean by, by uh, symptoms, but if your uh, biochemical markers were abnormal, you would then treat. And basically the algorithm was you started on Humira. If you failed that, you went to Humira every week. If you failed that, you went to Humira uh, and you went to azathioprine uh, in addition. But if you did better, you also had the opportunity to de-escalate. And in that target, in that uh, study, what you saw is that um, the treat to target was superior in terms of reducing um, mucosal inflammation and um, no deep ulcers, and then as well as a variety of these other outcomes. So now I'll update you in terms of what was presented this year. Now, this was really the main study, and this is more of just more of a proof of concept. So what they did is that they got the patients who were uh, who had the early intervention. Remember, some of them reached the endpoint, some didn't. And what they simply did is they said, okay, let's stratify your results by year one, and then let's do a follow-up after the trial. So this is not really, uh, this is kind of a, an after-the-fact analysis uh, where they contacted the patients. And what they did is they said, okay, if, what was the primary outcome after the trial? Did you get a new stricture, a fistula, hospitalization, and surgery? And what you see here is that if at the end of the COM trial you were in endoscopic remission, which is in red, um, you actually did better than if you were not in endoscopic remission. So your symptoms may have been uh, better, but that endoscopically you're not in remission. But you see that over time, this starts to, uh, they start to reach, um, get close to each other. Oops. Now, the, they had another definition of, of deep remission, and you can see that those patients actually did a lot better to the point where... Um, it says days until calm, 365, so maybe like five plus years out um, or m multiple years out. What you see is that still about 90% of those patients still were in some type of, of deep remission, and so they were doing quite well. And so this was really just a way of saying that, you know, the calm was really the main study. What this is is something that we kind of inherently know, but it's sometimes not a bad idea to continue to hear it, is that if you're bio-naive and that you actually um, are able to achieve endoscopic remission and actually deep remission quite early, that that will predict a really favorable course. And it really is another reason why we may you know, want to actually, it, it kind of gives another justification as to why we may want to actually treat to um, uh, objective biomarkers um, and that those patients actually do have a very good outcome uh, from then on. All right, so this one I think everyone's been waiting for, the varsity trial. So the varsity trial is um, kind of the first biologic head-to-head -head trial um, uh, for uh, gastroenterology for IBD. And um, I showed you there kind of the top line, kind of the headline is that vetalizumib shows superior efficacy over adalibumab for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. So you may have heard this or read about this, and so what I'll do is I'll, I'll review the study in a little bit. So this was a head-to-head -head trial. It was a phase three randomized controlled trial. It was double blind. Uh, and it was adult patients who had moderate to severe ulcerative colitis uh, and an endoscopic subscore of uh, more than greater than two. So I don't know for any of you, of you who use Mayo scores in the, in the office, but basically um, Mayo 0 is kind of normal. Mayo 1, um, I'll call this red. Mayo 2 is basically you start to have mucosal breaks. So technically mucosal healing is a Mayo 0 or 1. So even though it's inflamed, if they're not those mucosal breaks, um, you're below Mayo 2, so Mayo 2, and then Mayo 3 is really kind of severe ulcers. So you could see that endoscopically you had to have kind of a, a good amount of inflammation and mucosal breaks. Um, and this is just a technicality that 25% of the population, um, you were restricted to only one prior TNF. And so patients basically either received uh, vetalizumab IV um, and placebo uh, injections, or you received placebo injections and uh, uh, adalibumab uh, injectables. So. What you see there is really the, the, the top line. If you look at the overall clinical remission, and I'll go through this in a little bit of, of detail. So if you look at the overall clinical remission, you see that about 31% of patients achieve remission in week, a week 52 if you're on vetalizumab and 22% if you were on um, uh, adalibumab. 
uh, with a difference of about 9%. Now, if you divide that up between the patients who are TNF naive uh, and TNF exposed, you see that there was uh, a about a 10% difference, so kind of replicating the main trial, uh, if you are TNF naive, but that, dif that difference basically shrank to non-statistical significance if you are TNF exposed. And we can kind of do the math mentally, but um, this, is, you know, this is basically the top line results. Uh, similarly, if you look at mucosal healing, which is just simply another uh, way of objectively saying, you know, you know, are, these, are these results consistent? Uh, you see very similarly, if you look at the overall, the TNF naive and the TNF exposure groups, um, that there's about a 10 to 12% difference but that seems to go away if you look at uh, patients who are TNF um, uh, exposed, probably indicating that it's just kind of a sicker group. Uh, and this basically verbally just kind of dis uh, describes what we, what we just talked about, the clinical remission rates, mucosal healing rates, and the benefit primarily in TNF naive. Interestingly enough, if you look at safety, I mean, if you look at some other outcomes, steroid-free remission, there was a trend actually in favor that, that uh, adalimumab was better, but it was not statistically significant. And also might be a surprise that the adverse event rate um, was quite similar between the two groups. So the conclusion, though, is that uh, vetalizumab was superior to adalimumab in clinical endoscopic efficacy. Both were safe and well tolerated. And I think here, um, you know, we should really encourage these types of trials. And I think really if, you, if we kind of go based on what this said, um, if you're looking primarily at the TNF um, uh, naive group, that that's, I think, really where these results are probably the most applicable. Um, and uh, you know, we can talk uh, in the question and answer in terms of other nuances to this in terms of interpreting it, but uh, that, I think, is kind of the take home. All right, so now moving on to some other, let's check on time. So looking at other uh, studies, so I'm going to present two kind of small studies and then another important uh, randomized control trial that was presented on ustekinumab. Um, the next two have to do with ways of kind of losing response, so different strategies. Um, so for ustekinumab, again, an IL-23 uh, uh, inhibitor, uh, usually given as an IV first dose, and then as a subcutaneous injection every eight weeks. So this was a multicenter retrospective cohort study of just about 28 patients who had failed TNF before, and then basically were experiencing an LOR or loss of response, or only partial response to ustekinumab during the maintenance, so during the injection phase. And what they did here is that essentially, if you look at the red, what they decided to do is just to say, okay, if we just give a one-time dose of IV, uh, what do we get? And what you see there on the left uh, under the results is that if you reinduced uh, with IV ustekinumab, they, they actually have about 80% of the patients uh, either had a complete um, remission uh, or had a clinical remission uh, with a bio, uh, biochemical response, meaning that they simply got better. And you can see there that if when you reinduce you were actually then able to kind of boost up the drug levels, which would seem to make sense. So their conclusion was that IV reinduction can be used safely to induce remission in patients who have lost response or partial response. So again, it's a way of just, you know, kind of a trick. Um, you know, we, uh, if you, for folks who have been practicing for a while, it's not new. Um, but the thought is that, you know, you may not always necessarily have to commit to you know, upping the dose permanently in patients um, that sometimes kind of a rescue dose, depending on the right patient, uh, might be helpful. All right, and um, this is kind of a similar one. I'll go through this very briefly. Um, what they did is that they actually um, looked at various uh, ways of either going from Q8 weeks to Q4 weeks, giving a reinduction, adding an immunomodulator, or change a class. And so a lot of them are, are um, this is kind of a, a, a smaller study in terms of each of these groups are smaller. Um, and I will say, I just bring it up because interestingly enough, if you were losing response and you did nothing, somehow you got 100% uh, remission or response. So 0% had no response. So, um, but basically I think for, if you, in terms of losing response, the most common thing to do is basically to increase the dose every four weeks. Uh, but I think just giving a one-time IV induction is something for the right patient that you may want to consider. All right, so now this is uh, an important trial that has to do with ustekinumab and ulcerative colitis. And you're familiar with its use in Crohn's disease uh, and some of them have been using it off-label for ulcerative colitis, but um, the, this is now kind of, um, you know, the, the induction da data had already been presented, and so now DDW that presented the maintenance data. So what they did is they looked at the responders from the induction study and re-randomized them either into ustekinumab every eight weeks, which is the dose that we're used to, every 12 weeks, which is more for the dermatology do dosing, or placebo. Um, and in this trial, about half of them were, were um, you know, kind of sick. They had failed a prior biologic. 
And you can see there in terms of clinical remission at uh, 44 uh, weeks, you can see that the every eight week is in, is in purple, is in the dark purple, every 12 weeks is in the light purple. You see that both of those doses did better than placebo with numerically the uh, every eight week dose doing a little bit better. And if you look at corticosteroid free remission, you see the same pattern. If you look at clinical remission at uh, 44 weeks by the type of therapy, so the one at the very left with just all randomized patients is essentially the last slide. So if you focus on the next three ones, if you looked at patients who were either biologic failures, the Q uh, eight week dose actually did better than the Q 12 week dose. So for the sick patients, it kind of makes sense of giving it a little bit more frequently that those patients did better. So that's the right dosing. Interestingly, if you had not ever failed a biologic or biologic naive, which I don't quite fully understand that distinction, um, both the Q12 and the Q8 week dosing. So whether you did it more frequently or not, you had the same outcome, which is, I think, very uh, an interesting um, a point. So bottom line from this trial is that it looks this will probably be a new therapy for ulcerative colitis, and we always need more. For the biologic failures, the Q8 week is the right dose. And again, all of this has to do with label. But for the non-biologic failures, that either one of the two doses seem to work. All right, I'll go briefly that um, this is kind of, again, kind of retrospective that, I mean, I'm looking at the, the clinical trials for both ustekinumab and vetalizumab, that there are low rates of immunogenicity with both of those medications, um, and uh, about 2% for ustekinumab and 4% for, for vetalizumab. I guess my take home for antibodies and what to make of this is that, although this may be true, for patients who have failed um, biologic therapy, and you're moving on to the next one, particularly if they either have developed antibodies to the medication before, and that's the reason why they've lost response, I typically am adding some type of concomitant immunomodulator to prevent antibodies. So um, despite these kind of low rates, I would simply say that for the, for the patients who have failed therapy, regardless of the medication, I'm adding an, an, a concomitant immunomodulator. All right, so I'm kind of interspersing. This is another big one that you may have heard about, which is this Puccini uh, um, prospective cohort study. And this one was uh, done through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And the, the main reason is that you probably have interacted with your surgeons and they're often very concerned about anti-TNF therapy in terms of their, the, the surgery. And often they'll either delay surgery or make you stop the therapy early and go into corticosteroids. And uh, there was a little bit of ambiguity as to you know, can you give an anti, can you give an anti TNF? Can you give a biologic before surgery, and is it safe? And so this was a prospective trial or a cohort of, of uh, over three years at 17 U.S. centers, and they looked at all IBD patients undergoing intraabdominal surgery. And this is, I think, where when the when the paper comes out, it'll be a little bit uh, more helpful. So they caused an called an exposure um, if you basically had received an anti TNF within 12 weeks. Um, or if you had detectable levels preoperatively. And what they did is that they prospectively looked at risk factors uh, 30 days after surgery and looked for infections. And they did that through patient interview and chart abstractions. So they had about 955 patients who underwent surgery, and you can see the different types of surgery there. About 40% had a pre-op uh, TNF exposure, and 70% of the uh, TNF patients, even though the numbers don't quite add up, uh, had a detectable TNF level of some sort. And the, on the right is basically the bottom line. If you look at the percentage of patients with any infection, which was one of the key outcomes, if you looked at the patients who were not on TNF before, who were not exposed versus the ones that were, they basically had the same rate of infection, about 20%. If you looked at the subgroup who had a detectable level versus those who did not, again, the same, the same number. Even if it says value there, it's like almost 20%. Um, if you looked at surgical site infections, which is another important outcome, you see similar outcomes, about 12 to 13 percent in both groups. So this is really uh, an important study, and even though we need to kind of still wait for some of the details of it, um, it seems that for the most part, this is really a great study showing that pre-op use of anti-TNF drugs as determined either by history or by drug levels was not an independent risk factor for post-op infections. And one of the questions that did come up was, what if you gave the medication less than eight weeks? Um, and they also found that there was no difference. So I think that, um, again, we might quibble in terms of the definitions, but this is really an important one and one of the main, most, one of the more important um, uh, studies that came out of DDW. All right, so now I'm gonna finish off here and how much, uh, where are we? Oh, good, not too bad. So um, 
so now I'm going to finish off with uh, two papers that came out this past year that um, uh, I found interesting. So the first one has to do with the topic of biosimilars. And I guess I would say that, um, you know, now kind of now probably almost two years into uh, their, um, uh, I guess, their release in the United States, um, that there's an increasing body of, of, of evidence that really shows that they, they are equivalent. I mean, people may have had bad experiences. There may be intuitive reasons why it shouldn't seem right to switch or not switch. But if we kind of looked at the, uh, at, the, um, at the science, it does look to be quite similar. And really, this study is kind of helping to, to make that conclusion. Um, so just as a, as a quick backdrop, remember that for um, uh, biosimilars, at least the ones uh, like, like uh, Inflectra to be approved in the United States, um, what you need is you need two randomized controlled trials in any, um, in any condition for which it is approved in order to get the approval for all the indications. And there's a process, but that's basically the bottom line. So this drug was actually never looked at in Crohn's disease patients. And so this is actually a study that kind of gives me more confidence. So this is a randomized trial, um, multi-center, multinational, of 220 patients. And what they did, as you can see there on the left, it truly is just a head-to-head -head of Inflectra versus Infliximab, both induction and maintenance. So it's a type of trials that we're used to. And you see on the right the efficacy, which is basically clinical response and remission. And we can go through the individual components. But basically what you see is that whether you looked at a reduction in Crohn's disease activity index of 70 points, 100 points, or clinical remission, that both the biosimilar and the, and the branded drug basically had the same efficacy. And there was no difference in fecal calprotectin or CRP at week six or later, no difference in adverse events, and no difference in drug level. The added bonus, which is uh, part of this trial, that was published in Lancet, is then they did the right thing, which is then after that they re-randomized all the patients into one of four groups. So the infliximab group, you either half of those folks were on infliximab, half of them actually switched over to Inflectra, and of the Inflectra group, you either can continue on Inflectra or you were randomized to infliximab. And so now you have four groups. And you can see there in blue is infliximab, infliximab. Uh, in red is Infliximab uh, Inflectra, in green is, is uh, uh, Inflectra the whole way, and then uh, in purple is basically Inflectra, and then you, you switch to Infliximab. And again, you can see here that really the, the, the groups are basically um, no different. If anything, uh, the group that basically were, were exposed to Inflectra at any point seemed to do better in terms of a reduction in your Crohn's disease activity index, and you can see that the clinical remission is pretty much similar. So. For me, kind of after this trial, I felt like it's something that is at least tangible that we can actually talk to patients about um, and, and suggest that these truly are uh, biosimilar and, and equivalent in, in, in the ways that are meaningful. All right, last one. So this, you may or may not have, uh, have seen this paper. It, it, it got a lot of discussion. It was just published. And it has to do with using tofacitinib in uh, essentially acute severe ulcerative colitis that's hospitalized. But then in addition, we're not going to just simply give it in the hospital. We're actually going to use higher dose. So this is just four patients that were at the University of Michigan. And, um, you know, it, they, they kind of described them. There were a couple of other questions I would have liked them. But they said a high likelihood of failing IV steroids. Um, and they said that that was based on true love and width criteria, a CRP more than 100, and endoscopic features. So they were all scoped. They had a formal protocol. Um, and they had all previously failed IV steroids. So they all received steroids again, and then were dosed with, for, with tofacitinib at 10 milligrams three times a day, so 30 milligrams a day, which is higher than the 10 BID dosing that is recommended. And they did it for nine doses for three days. So it's basically a 72-hour super high dose or high dose, and then um, go back to the normal. And the reason why it's important is that um, you know, in the clinical trials, the 15 milligrams twice a day dose is when you started seeing an increase in infections. You definitely increased your efficacy, but you also increased your side effects. Um, and you can see there the various pictures of the four patients. So I think everyone would agree that they were all pretty severe. So patient one, patient two, patient three, patient four. Now, if you look at it, you can see over the hospital day is that all four patients had a very rapid improvement in their symptoms and a de uh, decline in the CRP. And what you're seeing here is actually a CRP. Uh, and you can see there, patient one, two, three, and four actually did all quite well. Patient three, you can see that they act, they described this patient as already coming in with some type of colonic dilation. They responded, but when they went down to five BID, it was part of their protocol, they actually got worse, and they ended up with an urgent colectomy. Uh, 
patient two did well, but they also underwent a colectomy at six months because they, they, when they were doing better, they had a scope and were found to have dysplasia. So this is something that I bring up only because you may have read it. I actually think that it, this is not something that I would do at home even for the sickest patient. I think this would be something that, um, uh, you know, they had a formal protocol. And so I think that given that there are certain risks associated with tofacitinib, particularly for infection, um, I think that I would wait for more information. I think this is a really good proof of concept, but I think that has to be studied more formally before trying this uh, in the hospital. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for your time and uh, happy to answer any questions.